The passengers on deck couldn't believe their eyes and ears. A loud horn blast radiated across the Mississippi River, and in front of them was the massive bow of a huge chemical tanker cutting through the water. The hearts beat faster, and quickly they ran, seeing the massive ship heading right toward their ferry just seconds before disaster. Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday. My name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for our younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay, everyone, let's get into it. Let's talk about the Mississippi River for a minute. For anyone living outside of the United States or for our younger audience, it is an enormous river that flows from Lake Itasca in northern Minnesota 2,340 miles or 3,766 kilometers down to the Gulf of Mexico. It is the second largest river in the U.S. behind the Missouri River by only one mile. The Mississippi River cuts the United States almost cleanly in half. And during the Civil War, this division in the country served both factions of a divided nation. Because of this, there are several shipwrecks in the river. Today's shipwreck is more modern than the Civil War, but tragic all the same. We're also going to talk a bit about the ferries down in Louisiana on the Mississippi in the 1970s. I know this seems like a lot of backstory, but it's important, so bear with me. Louisiana is a state riddled with waterways like an arm is veins, so Louisianans have relied on ferries to traverse parts of the state since the establishment of the first state ferry service between New Orleans' Canal Street and Algiers in 1827. As of 2020, only five ferries are still in state service, and they offer the following services. The Belchasse to Scarsdale Ferry, the East Point to West Point à la Hache, the Canal Street Algiers, the Lower Alger, Chalmay, and the Plaquemine to Sunshine. Before car ownership was the norm for many Americans, there were many more ferries, including the Luling to Destrian Ferry. Many of these ferries would later be replaced by bridges across the state as it became more common for Americans to own their own vehicles. The Luling Destrian Bridge, now called the Hale Boggs Memorial Bridge, was actually under construction at the time of the ferry disaster, just three quarters of a mile or 1.2 kilometers from the disaster site. The Luling Destrian Ferry would come to a close following the completion of this bridge just seven years later. There have been numerous disasters on the Mississippi River, including a few infamous ones like the Steamboat Princess disaster or the fire and sinking of Sultana. However, the MV George Prince disaster remains in a league all her own because of a few circumstances. Unlike the disasters of the Princess and the Sultana, the MV George Prince ferry disaster happened after the federal regulation of river traffic, stricter safety regulations, and the invention of modern technological communication devices. The last major peacetime incident on a nautical vessel in U.S. waters occurred in 1947 when the highly explosive ammonium nitrate fertilizer-laden SS Grand Camp exploded in Texas City, Texas, killing 581 people. Ferry accidents similar to the one we will cover today are not uncommon on the Mississippi River and usually result in little to no casualties. But before we get any further into the disaster, let's look at the two ships involved. This one is going to be a doozy because there are two ships at play here and we really don't have much background information for either of them, but I'll share what I could dig up. Let's start with the namesake ship, MV George Prince. MV George Prince, from what I could find, was a ferry that was 120 feet or 36.6 meters long, had a beam of 34 feet or 10 meters wide, and a gross weight of 259 tons, being powered by a 670 horsepower or 500 kilowatt diesel engine. She was equipped with two radar units and was built primarily of steel, and the original wooden superstructure was converted to add a 21-foot-tall steel house structure on the original steel hull at Avondale Shipyard sometime later in the 1960s. She was built in 1937 at Slidell and operated in Natchez, Mississippi for years before she was relocated to St. Charles Parish. She was at some point designated a free commuter ferry owned and operated by the Louisiana Department of Highways, and she'd have the designation LA Highway 52. Her crew consisted of five men, a pilot, engineer, and three deckhands. 
In 1969, the U.S. Coast Guard was asked by the state of Louisiana to cease inspecting the vessel since she was a free ferry and didn't carry passengers, quote, for hire. And the Coast Guard would heed this request. She did have one narrow escape, colliding with a smaller boat sometime before 1976, and there were no catastrophic injuries or deaths. It's also important to note she often shared her crew with other ferries in the area, such as the foot ferry between Taft and Norco and the vehicle ferry between Edgard and Reserve. MV George Prince wasn't the only ship the ferry operated on this route, with it and MV Ollie K. Wilde splitting the D. George Prince was the larger of the two, so she worked around the clock, while Ollie K. Wilde's was only on shift during peak hours. During these peak hours, the ships were not on a fixed schedule, departing and arriving at almost random times. Let's look into the other ship in this disaster before we take a deep dive into the disaster itself. SS Frosta was a Norwegian oil tanker built by a Bremer Vulcan in Germany and was owned by A.S.J. Lodwig Mowinkels Redery of Bergen, Norway. She displaced 22,856 gross register tons, 13,665 net register tons, and 36,010 deadweight tons. For everyone unaware of the difference between these units of measurement, gross register tons is a ship's total internal volume, net register tons is a ship's cargo volume capacity, and deadweight tons or deadweight is a measure of how much weight a ship can carry, and it is the sum of the weights of cargo, fuel, fresh water, ballast water, provisions, passengers, and crew. As for her other specs, in Imperial measurements, SS Frosta was 664 feet long and had a beam of 90 feet wide. In metric measurements, that's a length of 202 meters long and a beam of 27 meters wide. As for propulsion, SS Frosta was equipped with a steam turbine engine capable of producing 16,800 horsepower or 12,356 kilowatts. She was launched on July 27, 1960, with the IMO number 5122023, being named after the village of Frosta. In 1971, she was rebuilt as a chemical tanker by Christiansund Mekaninsky Verksted AS Christiansund, Norway. That leads us to the disaster. While we are on the topic of SS Frosta, we are going to start with her perspective first, and then move on to the perspective of MV George Prince. But before we continue, if you're enjoying the video, leave me a like, subscribe to the channel below for more content, and let me know down in the comments section. Okay, back to the story. On October 4th, 1976, SS Frosta and her crew left Rotterdam, the Netherlands, for Baton Rouge, Louisiana, with the voyage being uneventful. On the evening of October 19th, 1976, while at the southwest pass of the Mississippi River, Frosta took aboard the first of three pilots that were going to guide her up the river. At the time of the collision, she was on pilot number three, Nicholas Colombo, a member of the New Orleans Baton Rouge Steamship Pilots Association. On the morning of October 20th, 1976, SS Frosta was heading upriver, with Colombo directing the ship to go at 10 knots, which is 12 miles per hour and 19 kilometers per hour, and also was Colombo's preferred speed. The crew ordered a speed of half ahead, giving them the forward momentum of 11.4 miles per hour or 18.3 kilometers per hour, stemming a current of 1.1 miles per hour or 1.8 kilometers per hour. When SS Frosta was about a mile from the Luling Destrahan ferry crossing, they noticed a ferry cross from the west bank to the east bank, and this was MV Ollie K. Wilds. At the time, MV George Prince was on the east side of the river, passing two ships more to grain elevators on the east bank of the river. The river at this spot is more than half a mile wide, and since the pilot had now seen Ollie K. Wilds and was now aware of a ferry operation, it was at this point that the pilot observed a ferry, which we know as MV George Prince, departing the East Bank landing, heading upriver a bit. On his handheld transceiver, he called twice to the other ship with ample time for a reply, but there was nothing. After this, he blew the ship's horn twice, indicating he was going to pass the ferry. This two-horn blast had no meaning according to the Western River rules of the road, but it was a common occurrence in shipping at the time and was understood. By the time the horn blasted, the ferry had already turned to port, beginning to dash out in front of SS Frosta to the horror of the chemical tanker's crew. Meanwhile, from the perspective of MV George Prince, she was laden with a full load of vehicles and 95 passengers, most of these passengers being industry workers, starting her early morning journey from Destrehan to Luling, like she'd done many a time before. It was about 6am when she was still berthed on the East Bank landing, onloading her vehicles. 
The crew had been up all night and were expected to finally end their shift in an hour at 7 a.m., and they were tired from having been on shift for hours before the ferry incident. She faced upriver and took on 20 cars, 8 trucks, and 6 motorcycles with an unknown number of pedestrians. When looking at the passenger manifest, there's no breakdown of those with cars versus pedestrians. Roughly 20 of these passengers crowded into a waiting room to avoid the pre-dawn chill. When the two ferries were operating, they only relied on sight of each other rather than radio communications. And this morning, only one of George Prince's two radars was running. Once she was loaded, MV George Prince took off from the berth and made a short run upriver before attempting to cross, though she didn't give anyone any warnings that she was going to dart across the river. She also never acknowledged radio traffic with her radio either, or the continuous transmissions from SS Frosta or the horn blasts. SS Frosta was ordered full astern, though they did not attempt to steer their vessel, but it was for good reason. They were on the west side of the channel, and so they would have had to turn to starboard. And if the ferry had turned to get out of the way, SS Frosta would have turned and hit the ferry anyway. So the pilot also worried about striking the Hillbox Memorial Bridge construction site that we spoke of earlier, or one of the ships docked at the Green Elevator decided not to turn. They also ordered the propellers turned off as to not chop up any victims of the potential capsizing. The George Prince had her windows closed because of the cold weather that October morning, and none of the crew's responsibilities included being a lookout. And even if they did have a lookout, the only communication from the lookout to the pilot house would have been hand signals. So, when the crew veered the vessel over to cross the river on a wing and a prayer, they didn't realize they'd put themselves directly in front of SS Frosta. The warnings from SS Frosta were somehow not registered by any of the crew on the George Prince, and it was at that moment the fate for both of these ships was sealed. According to survivors, they noticed the Frosta as George Prince headed up the river, with anxiety about a collision first building and then waning as the belief that the ferry would maneuver around the ship took hold. As soon as these passengers heard the whistle of the Frosta indicating danger, they panicked, alerting the clueless passengers of danger as they fled in all directions. SS Frosta collided with MV George Prince at milepost 120.8 above Head of Passes, and from the moment of impact, it was clear that it was quite destructive, even though the Frosta's crew only felt a slight bump. The bow of the Frosta penetrated the porthole of the George Prince, allowing in tons of muddy, freezing cold Mississippi River water. The ferry rolled completely under the ship, popping out on the port side of SS Frosta, completely capsized. The crew of SS Frosta looked on in utter shock, horror, and disbelief as the stem of their ship was driven 8 feet or 2.4 meters to the side and as MV George Prince was violently shoved upriver before completely and quickly capsizing to the starboard side, tossing her full load of vehicles and most of her passengers into the water. Immediately, the pilot and crew of SS Frosta called upon the Coast Guard. They were on their way, but it would take a bit. During the impact, those on deck of MV George Prince saw Frost's hull rolling over them and many either unsuccessfully made it to the life jacket locker or sheltered inside their cars. After the capsizing, 18 passengers and crew were trapped inside the ferry while an unknown number of passengers sank to the bottom of the Mississippi in their cars. Of the survivors, 14 of them were launched off of the George Prince in the capsizing and four of them found themselves swept under the ship as she rolled. Only two people managed to put on life jackets before entering the water involuntarily. From the time MV George Prince left the dock to the time she capsized, less than two minutes had passed. In the time it takes to microwave a hot dog, an entire vessel was upside down. SS Frosta managed to maneuver safely through the construction area and anchored midstream over a mile upriver, being carried away almost entirely by forward momentum. If you're not familiar with Newton's first law of motion, it goes like this. An object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. In this case, the outside force was friction and drag created by the river water that eventually stopped SS Frosta. Once anchored, they launched two of their lifeboats to try to rescue survivors. However, they never saw any in the water and probably assumed they'd just killed an entire ferry's worth of people. The guilt that must haunt these men to this day must be paralyzing and I feel so awful for them. It was a freak accident and they did everything they could to remedy the situation. Let's get into the rescue. Out of 95 passengers, only 18 survived and 77 perished. 
Passengers who could see downstream quickly became aware of the situation and knew the collision was going to happen seconds before it did. Of the 18 survivors, 14 were thrown clear of the vessel and surfaced without issue. Three were briefly and terrifyingly trapped under MV George Prince, but did find their way to the surface. And the final survivor had run back to his vehicle, thinking he'd be safer there. After the collision happened, he narrowly survived by escaping out of one of his truck's windows. Only one of these 18 survivors had managed to get their hands on a life jacket, but didn't have enough time to put it on. Two men did find life jackets once they were floating in the river. However, neither had the proper time to actually get the thing on. Meanwhile, the other ferry, MV Ollie K. Wilds, was across the river preparing to offload vehicles at the West Bank Landing. The crew hadn't seen the collision take place, but one of their passengers had and informed the engineer, who burst into the pilot house and exclaimed that a ship had run over MV George Prince. The captain of the ferry immediately ordered the vessel to depart, despite the fact they'd only offloaded one of the 15 vehicles they had to offload. He got in contact with the pilot of SS Frosta and asked what had happened, to which the pilot replied, quote, He went in front of me, and I ran him over. Folks, you just can't even write fiction like this. This event is just unfathomable to me. Luckily, there was a St. Charles Parish Sheriff's deputy who just so happened to be commuting aboard Ollie K. Wilds, and he radioed in to report the collision to his dispatcher in Hanville, requesting immediate assistance. Because the crew didn't want to risk running over any survivors, the Ollie K. Wilds approached very slowly while crossing the river. They steered their ferry right up next to the capsized MV George Prince, almost touching the two ferries together, using benches from the waiting room to bridge the gap, and creating a bridge for 16 survivors clinging to the upside-down hull. These survivors came aboard safely. While the Ollie K. Wilds was crossing the Mississippi, a deckhand and the deputy had launched a small rescue boat, rescuing one survivor. So far, we are at 17 of the 18 survivors. Another tugboat came onto the scene, the MV Alma S, and she was preparing to help turn one of the ships at the grain elevator when the collision took place. After hearing the collision, the captain ordered the crew take off out into the river, proceeding slowly and carefully toward MV George Prince, where they noticed the survivors standing on the upturned hull. About 15 yards or 14 meters from the George Prince, the crew of Alma S heard a man cry out for help in the water, and they located him. The crew threw a life ring to the man, who secured it, and they pulled him aboard. And this rounds out our 18 survivors. All 18 survivors were taken to the West Bank Ferry Landing to wait for the expected arrival of aid. After help arrived, they were then taken to hospitals and stayed there for at least 72 hours. I'm so glad they survived, and I hope they've found peace. I can only imagine the survivors' guilt they must live with, and I hope they know none of it was their fault. Rest in peace to the 77 victims. I hope they are resting peacefully and that their families, friends, and loved ones have found peace, solace, and justice. After the survivors have been safely transported to hospitals for treatment, it's now up to the Coast Guard to recover the dead. From the frantic radio calls, the Coast Guard were immediately well aware of the collision and dispatched helicopters to the scene. One of these helicopters made one stop at Lakefront Airport, which is about 5 miles or 8 kilometers northeast of New Orleans, to pick up a diving team. This helicopter took off at 7.14 a.m. and arrived at the site just 11 minutes later at 7.25 a.m. They were on the vessel like ants on a cupcake just 9 minutes later at 7.34 a.m. And the divers rattled on the hull with their hands, trying to communicate with potential survivors within. Sadly, they received no response, as everyone was probably long dead by then. At 8.33 a.m., they reported they found no signs of life, and that other divers were then needed to search for bodies. I don't know about you, but this story has been hard for me. And at this point, dear listeners, my faith in humanity has been restored. Why, you might ask? Well, because we need a dive team. And after hearing news reports of the tragedy, a professional dive team drove themselves to the site and volunteered to go into a dangerous, dark, terrifying shipwreck and do the difficult task of recovering bodies for families. That is incredible. Recovering bodies from shipwrecks can be very dangerous for divers performing this task, and it can be incredibly taxing for them mentally. I'll link a video in the cards to the Filipino cave divers video of the recovery of bodies from the sinking of MV St. Thomas Aquinas. I'm just warning you, it is saddening, disturbing, and very powerful. These divers are incredibly gentle knowing that that person is someone's loved one, and so this task that our divers in today's story sign themselves up for is daunting to say the least. 
The dive team was equipped with airline masks instead of tanks, and so their movements were far less restricted than traditional divers. They were also very familiar with diving the murky blackout conditions on the Mississippi River. River diving is often harder because of the sediment stirred up by the current. Now we will be keeping track of the bodies recovered of the 77 who perished. The dive team recovered nine from the passenger compartment of George Prince, two from the pilot house, five from the engine room, one in a bathroom doorway, and one other in a storeroom. From the vehicles of George Prince, they recovered 57 and a portion of one more, all being recovered from October 23rd through the 27th of 1976, about a week after the collision occurred. The final body recovered was found in the river on May 22nd of the following year in 1977. If you are counting, that brings us up to our total of 77. Most of the time, not every victim's body is recovered, so that is a small period of respite we can take in this story. After all of the victims were recovered, it was time to try to salvage the George Prince and all of the vehicles littering the bottom of the Mississippi River. Charles Romer II, the father of future governor of Louisiana, Buddy Romer, was the state's director of administration at that time, and he assumed responsibility and coordination for the salvage efforts. In the afternoon on October 20th, 1976, a crane barge arrived on scene, preparing to lift the ferry and right her. At this point, she rested on the river bottom near the west bank, with the hull barely poking out of the water. The salvage crew righted the ship overnight, and by the next morning, they began to raise the vessel from her watery grave. This would continue late into the night, and at 10 p.m. on October 21st, the ferry was raised just enough to allow dewatering operations, and the river reopened to limited marine traffic. MV George Prince was towed to the Louisiana Department of Highways Yard in Plaque Mine, Louisiana, for a further investigation. Of course, the damage was irreparable, and the George Prince never cast out from the banks again. In October of 1983, the Luling Desteron Bridge opened, and thus ended the ferry in this area, with the dedication of the bridge having an ominous tone as those killed in the accident were remembered. Today, the asphalt ramps to the tops of the levees of this bridge are still extant, but have fallen into disarray. As for the investigation, we're going to hit the highlights because we already have the basic understanding of what happened here. The obvious is true. The sinking was at the fault of MB George Prince. But why did she just barge out into the river like she did? Well, her pilot, Egidio Adleta, was found to have possibly been drunk. His blood alcohol levels were at 0.09, and legally in the state of Louisiana, you're considered legally drunk if your blood alcohol level is 0.08 or above. Some of the crew also had blood alcohol levels at this state. Not only this, but they were acting complacently, were extremely tired, and possibly inebriated, so they were unable to detect SS Frost are approaching. They also had many violations, and we'll cover those briefly. Firstly, they did not sound a horn upon departing the East Bank Landing. They failed to keep a proper lookout. They failed to slow down or stop and reverse when approaching another vessel. They failed to signal intentions when crossing the Mississippi. They failed to navigate cautiously or wait until the danger of collision subsided. And lastly, they used their vessel in a negligent manner that threatened to endanger life, limb, and property. The biggest failing of the Frostus pilot is that he just should have started slowing down much sooner than he did, and that if he had, the collision could possibly have been lessened or avoided altogether. The panel even concluded that the Frostus pilot navigated SS Frosta negligently. However, given the unbelievable circumstances, I think he did a decent job myself. Three years after the collision, SS Frosta was decommissioned in 1979 and sold a scrap to BU Aoi Japan. This episode couldn't be possible without our lovely patrons. Thank you all so much. If you'd like to support the channel and future episodes, go to patreon.com slash shipwrecksunday to join. In conclusion, the entire crew of MV George Prince passed away as well as 72 passengers, and despite the failings of the crew, this is terrible, and we should remember they were all human beings. They made massive, horrific, and crucial mistakes that ended their lives as well as the lives of many others, and for that, I condemn their actions. However, I wish them and the 72 passengers lost peace in the afterlife. This story is incredibly saddening, mind-boggling, and hopefully the last of its kind. Rest in peace to all of the victims of the disaster, and I wish the survivors and their families well. That is the tragic sinking of MV George Prince. If you liked that story and wanted to hear more Mississippi River content, check out our playlist in the cards. 
Thank you for tuning into Shipwreck Sunday. For the next two weeks, I'll be taking some time off to spend with my family, and I will return Sunday, January 7th. Have a great week, happy holidays, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.